I do want to mention this is a benefit for botanical dimensions and KPFK. If you, if you didn't see the uh, promotional material at the back of the room, you might look at it during the intermission. Botanical dimensions is the real world kind of real politic response to the, all the issues that we deal with that Kat and I hammered out over the last uh, 11 years, really. And what it boils down to is uh, a plant rescue project built around a 20-acre botanical garden in Hawaii. And uh, what we're doing there is trying to bring in plants that are threatened in the warm tropics, either the extinction of the species is threatened or the knowledge of its medicinal or herbal or shamanic uh, use is in danger of being lost. Uh, there are a lot of fancy organizations, World Wildlife Fund, Earth Watch, Earth First, that are saving the rainforest or at least fighting that battle legally and by getting huge tracts of forest in the tropics made into reserves. Nobody is really even cognizes or is focused on saving ethnobotanical lore. In other words, the very subtle relationship between Aboriginal people and, and botanical resources in their environment. So uh, that's something we're doing. What was touched on last night, and which is sort of one of the centerpiece themes of this point of view, is uh, the felt presence of uh, some kind of alien intelligence that is somehow cotangent to the human experience for different people in different ways with varying degrees of intensity in different times and places. And though, you know, at the bedrock of my take on things is the notion that there is really finally a mystery wrapped in an enigma, that there is no resolution. Nevertheless, as you close distance with this mystery, there are um, a series of analogical metaphors that don't really suggest themselves, but that are communicated to you uh, by the other. And one of these analogical metaphors is the presence of this alien intellect, this uh, organized other that is folklorically present in tradition as fairies, gnomes, elves, jinns, afrites, sprites, tree spirits, uh, that sort of thing, and anecdotally present in uh, rural cultures throughout the world as the, the poltergeist and the milk-souring fairy, and it, the thing seems to reside in a curious area that is not epistemically clearly defined for the culture. In other words, the question of is it real or not is thought to be sort of tasteless. I mean, you, you would intuitively sense if you were drinking in an Irish pub, I think, and people began to spin leprechaun stories, that the question, is it real, is a real bring down. <laughs> you know, it, it isn't really like that because the question, is it real, is ultimately can be shown to be infantile in any situation. I mean, is the Bank of America real? Uh, what are, you know, immediately you realize that there are just assumptions skating over the mystery. But uh, this, this felt presence of the other, uh, I choose to talk about so much because it was for me such a, an astonishing personal surprise. My I was raised Roman Catholic and uh, indulged in the kind of 
theological fiddle-faddle that that involves and then grew out of that into atheism, into agnosticism and by the time I got to college I was reading Jean-Paul Sartre and Husserl and uh, these people and pretty much the main had followed uh, my intellectual ontogeny had followed historical phylogeny and I had arrived in the 20th century. Uh, and then uh, having abs thought I had absorbed the lessons of LSD, which seemed to me to be uh, to reinforce and confirm the theories of Freud concerning the dynamics of the psyche, that it was about repressed memory repressed desire, uh, sexual neurosis, parental, uh, you know, foul-ups in the projection of the parental energy patterns and this kind of thing. And then someone came to me one rainy February evening in 1967 and uh, a really a mad person, a kind of a social menace, an intellectual criminal. This guy had said to me only months before, we must live as if the apocalypse has already happened. <laughs> and, and here he was on my doorstep and, and, and he, he wore these little black suits that he buttoned up to the throat. Anyway, uh, he came in and he said something that you might be interested in and brought out a sample of uh, dimethyltryptamine that he had somehow come into contact with. And, and I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's this short acting, it's a flash, he said. And I said, you know, how long does it last? <laughs> that was my first mistake. <laughs> he said, oh, it doesn't last long. So I said, okay, we'll do it. And we did it. And uh, I discovered, I had, I guess it's called a peak experience or a core revelation or being born again or having your third eye opened or something, which was, it was a revelation of an alien dimension, of a brightly lit, inhabited, non-three-dimensional, self-contorting, sustained, organic, linguistically intending modality that couldn't be stopped or held back or denied. I mean, I sank to the floor. I couldn't move. And, uh, and uh, this disystolic hallucination of tumbling forward into these fractal geometric spaces made of light and then I found myself in the uh, sort of auric equivalent of the Pope's private chapel. <laughs> and, uh, and there were insect elf machines uh, proffering strange uh, little tablets with strange writing on them. And I was aghast, completely appalled, because it, the transition had been a matter of seconds. And my entire expectation of the nature of the world was just being shredded in front of me. I've never actually gotten over it. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, it all went on. I mean, they were speaking in some kind of, there were these, these, these self-transforming machine elf creatures were speaking in some kind of colored language which condensed into these rotating machines that were like Fabergé eggs but crafted out of luminescent superconducting ceramics and liquid crystal gels and all this stuff was just so weird and so <laughs> alien and so un-Englishable that I felt like it was some a, a complete shock I mean, the literal turning inside out of the intellectual universe. And I had come to this, uh, fair, I thought, fairly intellectually prepared, uh, 
you know, I mean, a kid, but nevertheless, double Scorpio, art history major, Hieronymus Bosch fan, Moby Dick, William Burroughs, you know. <laughs> And, and it was, uh, as I came down, and this, this went on for like two or three minutes, this situation of discontinent orthogonal dimensions to reality just engulfing me. And then as I came out of it, and the room sort of reassembled itself, I said, I can't believe it. It's impossible. It's impossible. But, I mean, to call that a drug is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it just means that you just don't know, you just don't have a word for it, and so you putter around and you come upon this very sloppy concept of something goes into your body and there's a chain. It's not like that. It's like being struck by noetic lightning. And the other thing about it, which astonished me, was there is no clue in this world you know in the carpets of central asia in the myths of the maya in the visions of an archembolo or a fra angelico or a bosch there is not a hint not a clue not an atom of the presence of this thing and when you look at the religious hierophanies of the human species uh, it doesn't have the same vibe it doesn't have the same charge. Religion is all about dissolving into unitary states of, uh, of love and uh, translinguistic oceanic unity and this sort of thing. This was not like that. This was more multiplistic than the universe that we share with each other. It was almost like... Uh, the victory of Neoplatonic metaphysics. Everything had become made out of a, a, a fourth dimensional tesseractural mosaic of energy. So I, I was uh, just quite knocked off my feet and set myself the goal of understanding this. There was really no choice, you see. And I don't know how it hits other people. I mean, there, is, there are many things that can be said about introducing a chemical into your body. Uh, they've shown uh, that certain people are 50,000 times more sensitive to the odor of certain compounds than other people. And part of the unique genetic heritage of each of us are our complement of synaptic receptors for psychoactive alkaloids so that you know there may be something to the notion that the Celts tend to be poets the you know certain people certain peoples tend to be expressive in certain artistic modes or or certain senses seem to be accentuated for certain human subgroups but uh, whatever the explanation for how it hit me I felt that it was like a call. There was no turning back from trying to understand that because there is no place for it in our world. And yet it is overwhelmingly, existentially real, you see, and easily accessed. I'm not peddling that you have to go to some place in India with poor sanitation and put yourself at somebody's feet for a dozen years or something like that. The, the enunciation of the presence of this dimension should inspire some kind of coming to terms with it. I mean, it's preposterous that we can entertain in our popular journalism the, uh, the titillation of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and prop up all these reductionist guys and trot them out to give the statistics on the distribution of G-type stars and all this sort of thing. Because the fact is, what blinds us to the presence of alien intelligence is uh, linguistic and cultural bias operating on ourselves. The world which we perceive is a tiny fraction of the world which we can perceive, which is a tiny fraction of the perceivable world. 
you see. So uh, we operate on a very narrow slice based on cultural conventions. So the important thing, if, if synergizing progress is the notion to be maximized, and I think it's the, mo- the notion to be maximized, is to try and locate the blind spot in the culture, the place where uh, the culture isn't looking because it dare not, because if it were to look there, its previous values would dissolve you see and I think that that place is the psychedelic experience as it emerges out of nature in, in, and as human societies interact with the psychedelic experience in nature they inevitably, they, they inevitably secrete the institution of shamanism like a pearl around the, this umbilicus or this nexus point or this loci of interdimensional uh, data flow, which is really what it is. It's that, when, that under certain conditions which have to do with these molecules that have evolved in these species which have this weirdly quasi-symbiotic relationship to our species you punch through the veil you know Melville said if you would strike strike through the mask and that's what's done you strike through the mask of of the coordinates of apparent reality and then this thing is there which to me is a miracle it transcended any miracle I could ever ask for because it not only had the quality of a miracle as I imagined it it had the quality of a miracle as I could not have imagined it it was entirely charged with uh, with the energy of the other it it had the ambiguity of a pun a kind of zany, impossible, improbable, hysterical uh, revelation of the joke, the the uh, self-contradiction, the provisional nature of it all. That it really is a Marx Brothers movie in some sense. So I uh, pursued it. First to uh, Nepal and involvement with pre-Buddhist shamanism in Tibet because I, I first, the thing that puzzled me most, I guess because I was an art historian, was this absence of the theme in the artistic productions of humankind. And I felt that maybe there was a trace of it in the artistic conceptions of the old pantheon of Tibetan shamanism and that Central Asian Tibetan shamanism had actually created astronauts of inner space that had gotten good recon on this same area. Uh, you know, the Dharmapalas, the guardians of, uh, of the Dharma, are not Buddhist deities per se. They are autochthonous Tibetan folk demons that protect the Dharma by virtue of the fact of having been overcome in magical battles by great Buddhist saints who came to Tibet. In fact, there are or were before the Chinese uh, uh, occupation monasteries in Tibet where the vow of fealty to the Dharma on the part of the Dharmapala had to be renewed by the monks every 24 hours or the uh, thing would run amok and be on its own and bust up the countryside. I'm just telling you what they told me. (laughs) So it seemed to me that this raw sense of the shamanically accessed demonic realm uh, was there and I also saw a, a traces in Hellenistic uh, Gnosticism and uh, alchemy but such thin traces 
so I went to Nepal, immersed myself in that, and decided ultimately that uh, it was inaccessible. I wasn't sure whether it was there or not. And then I placed myself in the context of nature by moving my sphere of operations to eastern Indonesia, to the climaxed continental rainforests of the ancient continent of Sundaland. You see, Indonesia was a continent until as recently as 120,000 years ago, and then with the melting of the glaciers and the subsidence of this continent, it became a vast group of islands. And I think that, that it was my good fortune or the fortune of my fate, because it was prudent for me at that time in the late 60s to remain outside the United States, and so I sort of had to become the hero I had pretended to my friends that I was, which I wasn't. I had an around-the-world air ticket and was entirely a preppy poseur. But <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, return was not a possibility. And so I became, and my apologies to Buddhists in the audience, a professional butterfly collector. And I pursued this blood sport for many months in these remote montane jungles of eastern Indonesia. And that was where the, the missing link in the quest for the resolution of the meaning of DMT and spirit fell into place. Because I saw what most of us only see on National Geographic specials, which is the real fact of the rainforest, the real fact of organic nature, and how nature is communication. Uh, not only are the species that comprise the biota linked by pheromones and acoustical signals and uh, color signals and all of these uh, various methods by which communication is seeping around. In fact, Nature ultimately resolves itself into a self-reflecting syntactical metasystem. And you can pursue this right down to the DNA. DNA working as it does with nucleotide sequences that code, code, right? That means arbitrarily assigned code for certain amino acids it means that organic objects are essentially utterances in three-dimensional space of some kind of universally distributed linguistic intent. This is what it means when it says, in the beginning was the word. Nature is that word, this infinitely self-adumbrating, fractal, syntactical hallucination that has an infinite number of facets for potential uh, regarding and self-regarding. And then, you know, might invoke here Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which, as I'm sure many of you know, was uh, Kurt Gödel's brilliant contribution to theoretical mathematics, where he showed that the possible set of, of true formal statements generated by any formal system was exceeded or exceeded the possible set of true formal statements which the rules of that system allowed. He showed this for simple arithmetic. Showed that, and what this means, friends, is that what was called truth up until the beginning of the 20th century is absolutely impossible. That's what Gödel's incompleteness theorem secures. It shows that there is, no there is no ultimate closure in an effort to describe. And so, in a way, my take on nature and culture and man is that human language is a meta-linguistic system generated out of the necessary formal incompleteness of nature. You see? 
It's that nature is a self-describing genetic language and yet out of it arises something which is not formally uh, predicted by its uh, constraints and rules. There's a symmetry break there and a, a so-called emergent property comes into view. And this emergent property is our unique ability to provisionally provisionally uh, code sound to meaning so that we then can freely command and reconstruct the world. We imagine that we do this for our own purposes of communication. The analysis that I'm suggesting would, would seem to indicate that actually we do it because we are complicated enzyme systems that are moving linguistic charge around inside some kind of meta system very important for the emergence of new order out of nature you see and I talked about this a little last night the fact that it is uh, contrived, provisional, is very interesting. It doesn't arise out of the gene structure. Rather, it is agreed upon by individuals who are living at the time that the, the linguistic structure, whatever it is, emerges into consciousness. Well, since individuals are replaced, the thing is much more in flux than the genome, you see. The genetic component of an organism is a physical structure stabilized by atomic bonds possibly stabilized by a phenomenon like room temperature superconductivity. In the, in the way nature works is to conserve the genes. And so molecular machinery has been created to do that. But there is no mechanism in nature uh, with the same kind of binding force that conserves meaning. Huh. Meaning is some kind of freely commandable, open-ended, self-evolving system. The rules are that there are no rules. Meaning consequently addresses itself to a much larger potential modality of expression than the genes. The genes basically repeat themselves over and over, almost like Homeric poetry where the idea is that it be memorized and repeated. And that's what sexuality is about, is memorizing and repeating gene structures, handing on parts of the story. But the epigenetic, uh, the, the creation of linguistic systems where meaning can be freely commanded allows very rapid evolution of cultural norms. And uh, what I suggested last night and want to say more about tonight is that this process is mediated by plants. It is synergized in human beings by plants of all sorts. I mean, we are obsessed with drugs and short-term uh, spectacular effects. But think about the effect on a culture of the presence or absence of, say, sugar, or the presence or absence of coffee, what human culture can essentially be seen to be is a series of plant-established developmental creodes for a higher mammal. The fact that we are omnivorous lays us open for the formation of these weird relationships to things in our food chain. Everybody is taught in school that the Renaissance, the close of the Middle Ages, the rise of urban culture, all had to do with the search for spices, 
right? Bringing spices back to Europe. Well, why was it so important, you know, that a, a drive to simply broaden the palate of Europe is given uh, credit for uh, the redefining of post-medieval civilization? Very strange. Hoffman and Ruck and Wasson showed that the Eleusinian mysteries uh, which were the philosophical and experiential linchpin of the ancient world's cosmology, the Hellenistic cosmology, was a cult of ergotized beer. There, every September at Eleusis, this mystery was carried out, and everyone who was anyone participated in it, and uh, you only got to do it once in your life, so you had only one take. The point is clear. As you look at human culture in all times and places, the way in which our cultural institutions have been molded by uh, these so-called tertiary compounds in plants is very suggestive. It seems to me that uh, the felt presence of the other, the alien intelligence, the being from outer space, is actually co-present with us on this earth and that the problem is not the finding of it but the recognizing of it when it is seen in the same way that I think the, in the present cultural crisis everyone is crying answers, answers we have to have answers the fact is we have the answers the question is to face the answers you know the answer to self-empowerment lies in the psychedelic experience the answer to dissolving the hierarchically imposed set of uh, mythical conventions that disempower us lies in the psychedelic experience because what is really happening is a return to the primacy of feeling and Feeling is not something you can convey to people the way you convey facts to them. Facts can be handed down every week through Time magazine and the latest issue of Science News and Nature. But feelings will not lend themselves to that marketable, hierarchically distributed uh, system. And consequently, feelings represent a backwash against that. Yet feeling is the modality in which we all operate. So as long as we are uh, under the umbrella of the print-created linear post-medieval institutions that promote the myth of the public, the notion of the atomic individual, the notion that we are all alike, basically, then we are going to be unempowered. The... Uh, amazing thing to me about the psychedelic experience is that it can be kept under wraps that people don't insist that somehow we're leaving it to experts to figure it out but did you know that the experts are uh, not allowed to work it out that in this particular area the entire human race has been relegated to an infantile status. Uh, it is not professionally possible to do work with these things. Nevertheless, our cultural crisis is deepening, deepening mainly because we have very poor uh, connections between our fragmented and autonomous psychic structures within ourselves as individuals and within ourselves as a society. Our whole problem is that we can't communicate with each other, we can't express intention. And the psychedelics are sitting there waiting to unify us, to introduce us to the translinguistic intention, to carry us forward into uh, a realm of appropriate cultural activity which is to my mind the realm beyond history beyond history lies effortless and appropriate cultural activity 
And nature has preceded us, as it always does, by laying out models that can be followed to realize this. Uh, as an example, uh, and, and by request, I'll point out that uh, the 19th century had a titular animal. Its titular animal was uh, the horse, idealized as the steam engine, the iron horse. And Marx talked about the locomotive of history, and there was, and there was this whole focusing on uh, the horse archetype, which in the 20th century gave way to the, the titulary animal, the raptor, the bird of prey, as exemplified by high-performance fighter aircraft, as the kind of ultimate union of man and machine in some kind of glorification of the completion of a certain set of cultural ideals, you see. Well, in thinking about this and in thinking about how language is the cultural frontier of our species, I went to nature looking for models of how we might move beyond the bird of prey, which when you think about it, it is the American symbol. It was also the symbol of the Third Reich. And a lot of creepy scenes have actually been into birds of prey. When Alaric the Visigoth, not even birds of prey, when Alaric the Visigoth burned Eleusis, it was uh, the, the crow fluttered on his battle standard as the greasy smoke swept by. So uh, the, these dark birds have been with us. Anyway, in looking for a new titulary animal and drawing the conclusion of what it would mean, I was drawn to uh, look, strangely enough, at cephalopods, octopi, because I felt that, first of all, they are extremely alien. The break between our line of development in the phylogenetic tree and the mollusca, which is what a cephalopod is, is about 700 million years ago. Nevertheless, and many of you who are students of evolution know that when they talk about parallel evolution, they always drag out the example of the optical system of the octopi because isn't this astonishing? It's very much like the human eye and yet it developed in entirely independently and this shows how the same set of external factors impinging on a raw gene pool will inevitably sculpt the same organ to the same end and so forth and so on. Well, the optical capacity of, of uh, octopi is one thing. What interested me was uh, their linguistic organization they are virtually entirely nervous system. First of all, they have eight arms in the case of the, oct in, of the octopods and, and uh, ten arms in the case of the squid, the decapods. And uh, so coordinating all these uh, organs of manipulation has given them a very evolved nervous system. Then they have this highly evolved ocular system but what is really interesting about them is that they communicate with each other by changing the color and texture of their skin and their physical shape. You may have known that octopi could change colors, but you may have thought it was camouflage or something very passive like that. It isn't that at all. They have a vast repertoire of traveling bars, dots, blushes, merging pastels, herringbone patterns, tweeds, mottled this and that, uh, can blush from apricot through puce into dove gray and on to olive, do all of these things uh, communicating to each other. That is what this large optical system is for, is to be able to see each other. The other thing which they can do, besides having these chromatophores on the surface of their skin, is they can change the texture of the skin surface, can make it rugose, papillate, smooth, 
uh, uh, lobed, rubbery, runneled, so forth and so on. And then, of course, being shellless mollusks, uh, they can hide arms and display certain parts of themselves and carry on a dance. Well, when you analyze what is going on here, it, it, what at first seems like merely fascinating facts from natural history begins to take on a more profound uh, aspect because it is an ontological transformation of language that is going on in front of you. Note that by being able to communicate visually, they have no need of a conventionalized, culturally reinforced dictionary. Rather, they uh, experience pure intent of each other without ambiguity because each octopod can see what is meant. This is very important, can see what is meant. And I think that this heralds or could be made to herald a transformation in our own definitions of language and communication. What we need is to see what we mean. It's not without consequence or implication that when we try to communicate the notion of clarity of speech, we always shift into visual metaphors. I see what you mean. He painted a picture. His description was very colorful. It means that when we intend to indicate a lack of ambiguity in communication, we shift to visual analogies. This can, in fact, be actualized. And, in fact, this is what is happening in the psychedelic experience, is that we discover just under the surface of human biological organization the next level in the organization of language. It's the ability to generate some kind of acoustical hologram that is manipulated by linguistic intent. Now, don't ask me how this happens because uh, nobody knows how it happens. At this point, it's magic. Nevertheless, the fact is it does happen. You can have this experience. It represents a synesthesia in the presence of ongoing communication. It is, in fact, telepathy. It is not what we thought telepathy would be, which I suppose if you're like me, you imagine telepathy would be hearing what other people think. It isn't that. It's seeing what other people mean and them also seeing what they mean so that once something has been communicated, both parties can walk around it and look at it the way you study a Brancusi or a Giacometti in, a, in an art gallery. By eliminating the ambiguity of the audio signal and substituting the concreteness of the visual image, the membrane of separation that allows the fiction of our individuality can be temporarily overcome, you see. And the temporary overcoming of the illusion of individuality is a much richer notion of ego death than the kind of white light null states that it has imagined to be. Because the overcoming of the illusion of individuality has a uh, political consequence, political consequences. The political consequences are uh, that one can love one's neighbor, you see, because the commonality of being is felt, felt, not reasoned toward or propagandized into or behaviorally reinforced but felt. This is why uh, the, there is this persistent notion which tracks these psychedelic compounds of uh, 
a new political order based on love which is you know I mean a hard it was a hard thing to say in the panhandle in 1965 it's not easy to say in heavy metal LA in 1987 uh, but it seems to be the fact of the matter that love which poets have celebrated for eons as ineffable may in fact have certain ineffable dimensions attached to it but it may in fact be more effable than we had previously cared to imagine and it's the invoking of the effability of love has to do with discovering the shared birthright the a temporal dimension that is co-present with this reality and that is a vast reservoir of uh, anchoring existential anchoring for each and all of us in our lives so my response to feeling the political pull of this feeling the power to transform language that resided in these things was to go to the people who I thought would know most about it the shamans for whom hallucinogenic shamanism has never been an issue for whom the notion that you're supposed to do it on the natch is a patent absurdity I mean if you're serious about doing it on the natch I suggest you eliminate all food because this notion of the pristine self somehow riding above the muck of the world carrying on a spiritual evolution is absolute foolishness I mean we are made of the stuff of the world uh, uh, people who do not confront the presence of the hallucinogenic possibility are turning their back on their birthright in the same way that if you do not experience sex throughout your life you are turning your back on your birthright I mean after all we could argue that to allow another person to touch you is to not do it on the natch right <laughs> but dear friends we're slicing too close to the bone here to take that approach it's much better I think to open to the world the world is communication nature is uh, the great teacher all human gurus are simply uh, distillations of the wave of nature that is coming at you so you can just short circuit the whole human boil down and go straight to the executive suite by putting yourself under a tree in the wilderness I mean they all have said this but they need to be taken more seriously on the subject of their own expendability me too <laughs> going to the Amazon with these kinds of notions and looking at what had been achieved there I, I came to have a vision then of the future that could be that we are sort of hurling ourselves into a new stone age where the the fruits of the prodigal wandering that I discussed in such detail last night can be used to infuse new meaning into that paradise the the imagination of man and woman is so incomparably rich and so and exerts such an attraction on us as the builder monkey that we have to honor that we cannot demonize that and and uh, and preach a kind of naturalism that if actually put in place would cause the starvation of tens of millions of people we have passed the point where some kind of Luddite reform can save us 
It's only, I think, very self-indulgent elites that can preach voluntary simplicity because uh, a lot of people are experiencing involuntary simplicity. And uh, unless you're one of them, it rings rather hollow to, to be told that Zen values are, uh, are best. So I think that reinserting ourselves into nature is uh, inspiration for cultural design. That's what it is. It's not flight from the design process, but a reinvigoration of it. And uh, some of you may be aware of the concept of nanotechnology, where everything is built at the molecular level. We, by studying the mechanisms of the cell and the immune system and DNA, we begin to have a picture of how molecules and atoms are the machine parts of a microcosmic world that if we were elf chemists, we could make our way into and create anything that we could imagine. I mean, I can foresee a world where all machines will be made by DNA-like polymers that will code base materials into larger and larger aggregates. Uh, the miniaturization of our world is a great frontier. As culture becomes more enveloping, its physical manifestation should become less uh, material, you see. So the ultimate notion is of the world turned back to the form it held, let's say, 35,000 years ago where people live in an environment of entirely climaxed natural perfection. However, behind their eyelids lies a culturally and consensually validated data phase space that is culture, civilization. Turn each of us into a telepathic aquarium to, that has a direct pipeline to the general ocean of mind and being. Th this is possible. In fact, it's not only possible, it may be the only uh, decent solution to download ourselves into another dimension. And I want to note in passing the collapse of Max Headroom and what a tragedy I think that is that his last show was last night. Uh, this was a weird force for cultural transformation, but to be applauded. Uh, if anybody here tonight has anything to do with it, uh, I wish them luck. But this sort of notion, you know, people, uh, the Max Hedrum people and the William Gibson people have a very high tech take on this because they are interested in accentuating this tight blue jeans, cyberpunk kind of notion. But in fact, the worlds that they describe will have many, many different social subgroups and social ecosystems forming in them. What the future really means is a choice to become who we are, to flower out, to find our own way. McLuhan saw all this 20 years ago. He said that the, the rise of global electronic feudalism would create an atomistic fragmentation of culture. It may well be that within 50 years, the largest uh, organizational entity on the planet will be corporations with a few million loyal employees. And all larger social institutions will have disappeared because they don't command loyalty in a, uh, in a uh, social environment where direct experience has become empowered. And this empowering of direct experience, this return to the feminine, this uh, legitimizing of the presence of the vaster regions of the unconscious, these are all aspects of this emerging paradigm of the spirit. Understanding and imagination in the light of nature which is what this two-night party has been called, 
is a definition of the spirit. Understanding and imagination in the light of nature. In other words, true understanding, poetic imagination, standing as a mirror before nature as object will cause the hologrammatic presence of the spirit to magically appear. It will be then seen to be a kind of emergent quality of the situation that was previously masked simply because the elements had not fallen into the correct uh, arrangement. And I think, you know, as we move forward through time over the next 25 years, there will be many prophets of the transcendental object at the end of time. Many takes. The important thing, I think, is to recall Gödel's incompleteness theorem and to always recognize the provisional nature of the metaphysical goods that you're going to be sold. Nobody has the faintest notion of what's going on. It's important to keep that in mind. If you have that in mind, everything else, then the game proceeds much more cleanly. Uh, What is ahead of us is true high adventure. The essence of it is its unknowability. Its promise is transformation. Its theater of occurrence is the here and now. We are not waiting for it to begin. It has already happened for us and our job is to understand how that can be so. Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. My notion of shamanism is it is that state of mind which accrues to those who have seen the end. By cultivating this this notion of closure with hyperspace imaged as the archaic return to the world of the pre-cultural ambiance, we can have an anticipation of the transcendental object. It is still in Eden. It is we who have undergone the fall and the recurso. And now the laden prodigal returns to beat at the doors of the manorial home, the birthright. And within, I think, lies uh, the beginnings of true civilization. We are the forerunners of a truly moral and ethical human society. The deepest aspirations, however badly mangled and mishandled by our traditions, nevertheless still have the potential for archetypal fruition within them. The torch that has been passed from generation to generation ad infinitum back into the distant past is alive. And by some strange quirk of the metaphysical machinery, it's our great privilege to live through this cemetery break, this revelation of the next level of the open-ended mystery. And I think that the real thrill lies in relating to it with an open mind, a sense of caring, a sense of wonder, and a a sense of real, grounded, intellectually firm uh, hope. So that's all I want to say this evening.